Chapter 5 Azric awoke with a gnawing in his stomach, a dry mouth, and a great deal of pain. He turned his head and saw Delinda, apparently asleep, in a chair near his bed. She must have sensed his return to consciousness, because her eyes opened as he looked at her. Azric, you're awake! she cried, and nearly fell out of her chair as she rushed to his side. She pressed her small hand against his cheek and kissed his lips. I was so worried. I gave you the healing potion we made, and it closed your wounds, but you had already lost so much blood by the time Lord Zornan brought you back. Azur touched the wound on his chest and winced in pain. The potion stopped the bleeding and closed the wound, but it did not come close to completely healing it. I have been giving you the fast heal potion as best I could in the meantime, but it is such a horrible injury. I did not know if it would be enough. Azric reached up and wiped away the tears streaming freely down her cheeks. Delinda took his hand in hers and squeezed it gently. I prepared another healing draught, but it will not be ready for at least two more days. You have already been asleep for nearly four days now. Azric pointed to a pitcher on the small table next to his bed. Oh, of course, I'm so sorry. Delinda filled a cup halfway with water from the pitcher. The water was a welcome relief to his parched throat, even though he coughed a large amount of it back up onto his chest. He sipped at it more slowly, as his beloved tilted it up to his lips. You must be hungry. Do you think you could eat something? Yes, please. I'm starving. Let me go to the kitchen. I'll be right back. Delinda darted out the door and down the stairs. Hazard tried to recall the events of the battle just before he blacked out, as Delinda's footsteps echoed down the stairs. He remembered Rangor had stabbed him deeply in the chest, he recalled a lot of blood, and the air bubbling out of the wound. After that, his memories became fuzzy. He was sure he had used his new spell, but he could not remember the exact results. It must have been successful, or he would certainly be dead right now. He was surprised he had even lived through his so-called victory. Delinda returned a few minutes later with a bowl of honey-sweetened porridge. Cook was glad to hear you're awake. I imagine Zeb and the others will learn of your recovery soon enough, and will wish to give you their regards as well. Azric smiled, and nodded his head in appreciation of his friend's concerns and well wishes. He gratefully took the bowl Delinda offered, and took little bites of the warm, soft food. He had a hard time eating even the small bites, but he forced himself to work through it until the bowl was empty. He leaned back against the pillows once more, his hunger satiated. With the food weighing in his stomach, he felt his eyelids getting heavy and fell back to sleep while Delinda stroked his hair. He had no idea how much time had passed when he next awoke, but his stomach told him it had been substantial. There was some soft bread and liver paste under a glass dome next to the water pitcher on his side table. Azric managed to pour himself a cup of water and helped himself to the small repast. He felt stronger this time and was able to eat the simple fare without too much difficulty. He looked up when he heard the door creak open as Delinda stepped into the room. Oh, you're up again. I'm sorry I was not here when you woke. I had to attend to my duties. That's all right. I just woke up a few minutes ago. You seem much stronger today. She sat on the bed next to him. I'll get you some warm food if you feel up to eating. Definitely. Azric replied gratefully as his stomach let out a loud growl of agreement. I'll be right back then. She returned a short while later with a large steaming bowl of stew thick with vegetables and diced chunks of meat. She also carried a silver flask Azric recognized as the one containing the healing potion. I think this is ready now. You can take it after you finish eating. Azric felt his strength slowly returning as he devoured the bowl of stew. Once he wiped the bowl clean with a chunk of bread, Delinda unstoppered the flask and handed it to him. He took a short sniff of the pungent liquid before draining the contents in one long pull. He winced at the bitter taste and handed the empty flask back to Delinda. A warm heat spread through his body as the potion worked its way through his bloodstream. His wounds began to tingle and itch as it forced their rapid healing. How do you feel? Like getting out of this bed? You shouldn't push yourself too soon. Azra grinned at her mischievously. Well, if I can't get out of bed, maybe you should get in. He grabbed her wrist and pulled her down to him. Azric, stop it! You're recovering from nearly being killed! She chided him, but did not resist as he kissed her. That's the difference between nearly getting killed and getting killed. Delinda sprang from the bed with a gasp when the door swung open. 
Leave us, girl, Lord Zornan commanded. Delinda skirted past her master warily, with one last fearful glance back at her love, before she fled the room. You have recovered significantly from your grievous wounds, I see. Azric did not respond to the statement. That witless half-orc very nearly killed you. Do you realize how shameful it was for me to have your nearly lifeless carcass hauled out of the arena? I won. Isn't that the important thing? I win too easily, it shames you. I win with great difficulty, and it shames you. The crowd surely enjoyed it. So what is it I have to do exactly to please you? You were nearly beaten. You, a powerful sorcerer, were nearly beaten by a savage creature swinging a sword. Your weakness in the battle reflects poorly upon me. Your weakness in the games is construed as my own failure in properly training you. I will not be humiliated like that again. Azric was surprised at the Silent's vehemence. It was the first time he had ever heard his master raise his voice in anger. These thoughts were lost as his whole world began to swirl and dissipate like a morning mist blown away by a powerful wind. Warped wooden planks replaced the mob stone walls of Azric's room. The smell of smoke filled his nose and burned his eyes, and he began coughing to clear his lungs of the contamination. He turned his head at the sound of a child crying. He saw Maggie in the corner, holding little Beth in her arms, as flames climbed up the tinder dry walls. He looked around the room, and saw John and the others sitting forlornly near the center of the room. John, we have to get out of here! Azric shouted. It won't do no good, boy. We're already dead. Azric ran across the room and slammed into the door with his shoulder, but it would not open. Something was blocking the door shut. His shirt sleeve caught fire, and he slapped it out with his hand. He heard Beth wail louder, and turned to see her dress had caught fire, and was burning her small legs. Azric ran over, and tried to smother the flames, but they continued to spread, and ignited his shirt. No! He shouted, as he felt the searing heat burn his arms, raise blisters, and char his flesh. The flames disappeared, and the room shifted once again. He saw he now stood in the room he once shared with his mother at the inn. As he turned and looked around, he saw a large man looming behind his mother. Azur tried to scream a warning, but his voice came out as nothing more than a weak croak. Azur charged forward and grappled with a big sailor as he tried to grab his mother. Harlow was considerably larger and stronger than the young Azric was, and easily pinned the boy beneath his bulk. His breath reeked of alcohol, and his large hand wrapped around Azric's throat. In his other hand was a sharp, curved knife that Azric fought to keep away from him. He drove a thumb into Harlow's eye. The big sailor reeled back with a roar of pain and released his grip on Azric's throat. Azric grabbed the hand holding the knife and twisted it around until he heard bone snap. Harlow dropped the blade with another bellow of agony. Azric scooped out the fallen blade and stabbed the drunken sailor in the stomach, causing him to fall backward off him. Azric rolled to his feet and sprang on top of Harlow, squeezing his eyes shut in rage as he plunged the knife into him repeatedly while shouting a wordless, feral scream. Azric opened his eyes when the body under him stopped fighting and shouting. He looked down in horror as the face of his mother looked up at him in anguish and then anger. You killed me, Azric! Why did you kill me? His mother wailed. He spun toward the source of another voice behind him. Azric recoiled as he looked at the pale, dead face of his father. His throat was cut and dried blood covered his neck and chest. I am disappointed in you, Azric. You were supposed to be the man of the house while I was gone. You were supposed to protect your mother, but you let her get murdered. I tried, father. I tried to protect her and take care of her. I swear I did. I was just a boy, father. And what about now? The shade of his father demanded. You sat in that school like a high-born prince. Why have you not avenged me? Do I mean nothing to you now? Now that you think you are some powerful sorcerer, your family no longer matters to you. I have not forgotten you. Who killed you, father? Who killed you? The ghosts of his parents stalked toward him, reaching with desiccated claw-like fingers. You, you did. did. 
they chanted in unison. You did. You did. You did. You did. His room spun back into view. His throat was raw from screaming, and his body was soaked in cold sweat. Lord Zornan stood at the foot of his bed staring at him, with his arms tucked inside his voluminous silk sleeves. You see how I can punish you when you fail me. If you fail me again, your punishment will be far more severe. I will hurt you in ways you cannot imagine. I fought as best I could, and I did win. Does that not count for anything? Azric asked in a whisper, fearing his voice would crack if he spoke louder. Fortunately, you were victorious no matter how hollow that victory was for me. Because of the severity of the wounds you took, others criticized me for being an ineffectual master. Perhaps there is some truth to their accusations. I have made an error in not taking a more direct role in your training. Azric shuddered as he listened to the siling admonish himself, not because he thought Zornan actually felt any responsibility, but because such self-recrimination could only mean something unpleasant was in store for him. These last several days, I have researched ways in which I may speed your learning, and I am confident I have discovered a method that has a nearly equal chance of being successful. A nearly equal chance of being successful, or what? Azric asked. Of destroying your mind, of course. It is a rash action, but a necessary one in my view. Fortunately, my view is the only one that matters. In a blink, Lord Zorn enclosed the few feet separating him from his slave, and clasped a cold, long-fingered hand over the top of Azric's head. The convalescent sorcerer tried to pull away, but he wasn't able to move a single muscle. He moaned loudly, his attempt to scream coming out as a strained whimper. It felt as though the Siling's fingers were piercing his skull and digging into his brain. Strange lights and images of such complexity he could barely make sense of them whirled through his mind. Sigils and arcane runes burned in his vision like the floating spots the sun left when you stared into it too long. Unfamiliar words of power echoed deafeningly in his head, like temple bells. Azric had no idea how long it lasted, but it seemed an eternity. The sights, sounds, and at least some of the pain left as quickly as they had come. Total blackness replaced the chaotic images and noise. Azric was certain he had not slipped into unconsciousness, at least not like any form of slumber or trauma-inflicted blackouts he had experienced before. His body floated in an ethereal oblivion, but he was aware. He could think, but he could not feel, hear, or see anything. Where was he? Was he still on his bed in his room? Was his mind shattered? Did his body live on as a mindless shell? Would he exist until he starved to death? Or would his consciousness wander in this endless void even then, floating through this nothingness for all eternity? Azric found that by concentrating, he could move his body. At least, he thought he was moving. There was no sense of motion, since there was no object on which to judge his movement. As he slowly turned, he thought he spied a thin line in the distance only slightly brighter than the blackness around him. Azric blinked, unsure if he had seen anything at all. He slowly turned his head from left to right and picked up the line in the very periphery of his vision. He imagined himself moving toward it at an oblique angle, so he would not lose sight of it again. As he drew nearer, the line grew brighter, until he could look at it straight on, without losing it. Azric stared confusingly at the jagged line hanging in the empty void, unsure of what it was. It appeared to be a hair-thin crack in fine crystal, if crystal were made of perfect blackness and had no substance. He pondered this enigma, for an indeterminate amount of time. Time simply had no meaning here, wherever here was. Azric concentrated and circled around it. He felt a sudden sense of unease, almost panic, when the mystical fissure disappeared. Azric was relieved when it reappeared as it came full circle and floated before it once again. It appeared that whatever it was existed only in two dimensions, 
much like Magus Alistair's gate spell. On a whim, he pressed his eye against the faint line, wondering if he could see anything beyond it. Through the fracture, he could see Delinda weeping over his prostrate form on the bed. His view shifted, and he could see himself lying on his bed through her eyes. Azric looked closer and saw a golden aura wreathing his body. He was certain Delinda could not see this aura, but he could not say how he knew. He looked at his floating body within the void, and saw it was limbed in a sickly green instead of gold. Azric peered back through the fissure and studied Delinda. She too was outlined in the same sickly green aura he had in this place. Why did he have two different auras? He was floating in an endless void he was certain was not a physical place. It possessed a flaw that allowed him to see the physical world, but his body had a different aura there. Delinda had the same aura in the physical world that he had in this one. The flaw is in my psyche. The green aura is the taint of the Silings' mental control. The fissure is a crack in the mental domination Lord Zornan has over me. Through that tiny breach, he saw himself free of his master's mental shackles. Azra began shouting, kicking, and clawing savagely at the flaw in an attempt to widen it. If he could get his spirit through it, he would be free. He knew what he would do if he could free himself. He prayed he would have the luxury of time to inflict the amount of pain he desired on the siling. He threw his mind at it with all his will. He imagined a mental wedge jammed into the crack and forced the fissure to expand. There, at the end, it split just a fraction. He redoubled his kicking and mental pounding and watched as the crack expanded millimeter by millimeter. Azric began to notice the blackness was growing lighter. Black turned to gray, and gray slowly turned to white. The white began resolving itself into colors that became shapes. He realized the shapes were the objects in his room, and Delinda sitting next to his bed. Azric! Oh, Azric! I thought he had killed you! She wept. Delinda threw herself onto him and held him tightly. Azric tried to shove her away. No, no, I have to go back. I was almost out. I was almost free. Delinda sat up with tears in her eyes and a look of shock on her face. What do you mean you were almost free? What's wrong with you? Are you hurt? I was almost free of Zornin's domination. I could see myself through a weakness in his control. I don't know how he got there, but I think it has something to do with whatever he did to me. I think he caused a small breach in whatever compels us. I'm not sure what you mean. I'm just glad you're all right now. Are you okay? My head hurts terribly, but I think I'm all right. At least as all right as I was before. Azric reached out with his mind to touch the source and found it there to do his bidding, just as it had been before. He touched his wounds and found they were still tender, but not debilitating. He got out of bed and washed up with the fresh water in his wash basin, then got dressed eager to move about once more. His muscles felt weak and clumsy, and he tired quickly. He sat down on the edge of his bed and held Delinda's hand. How long was I out this time? He asked, feeling a bit ashamed for neglecting Delinda's concern for him. Three more days. I heard you screaming and ran up the stairs, but I dare not enter the room. I wanted to rush in and claw that beast's eyes out with my bare hands for whatever he was doing to you, but I could not. I don't see any wounds on you. How did he hurt you? She asked as she stroked his shoulder. He brought back my most horrible memories and twisted them to make them even worse. Then he did something to me. I do not know what he did, but it hurt badly. When I came back to my senses, I was floating in a lightless void bereft of all sensation. Then I saw the crack or breach in my mind. I tried to break through and was starting to succeed before I woke up and was pulled away from it. Delinda looked at Azra quizzically. Can't you find it again? If you found it before, you can find it again and free yourself. Azra shook his head. I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know how I got to wherever I was or how I could possibly get back there. Maybe you can enter a trance or through meditation of some kind. If it can be done, I know you can do it. You will find a way. Azra hugged her tightly and kissed her grateful for her confidence in him. Let's go for a walk. I need some fresh air. Are you sure you're strong enough? 
My head is still a little loopy, but I really need to get out. Walk with me through the garden. Delinda helped him stand and slipped her shoulder under his arm. All right, but let me help you, at least on the stairs. Gladly. Azric was able to cross the room without trouble, but he was grateful for Delinda's steadying hand traversing the stairs. She helped guide him through the glass pane double doors leading into the garden. Azric relished the cool air, even though the smells of city life tainted it. Negotiating the stairs had taken a considerable amount of energy out of him, and he was ready to take a rest on the first marble bench they came to. I wonder how long it'll take our spider-faced master to find out he didn't kill or cripple me, Azric said to Delinda as they sat down on a bench under a red-leaf tree bearing resemblance to a maple tree. Not long at all, my pet, came Lord Zornin's immediate reply. Azric jumped despite himself and looked furtively around. The Siling had silently walked up on them and was standing just a few yards down the path Azric and Delinda had just come down. Delinda gasped in surprise, and Azric could feel her shiver in fear. Do not be terribly alarmed. I have grown accustomed to your impertinence, and find your feeble attempts at resistance amusing on occasion. Do not presume to construe my tolerance as license to act inappropriately. It would be unpleasant for you if you should overstep your bounds or try my good humor. You seem to be in a better mood than when you last saw me. It was necessary. I am pleased you survived. I have too much invested in you to have you easily replaced. Have you discovered the gift I gave you yet? If you mean the splitting headache and horrible nightmares, then yes. I expect you will return to your studies tomorrow or the next day. Search your mind, and you will find I have paved a path to new potent spells. It is beyond even my extraordinary power to imbue you with the ability to know them outright. It will require study and training, but I have laid out the path for you. It will still take a great deal of work on your part, so do not procrastinate. The Siling stared at Delinda for several uncomfortable seconds, turned around, and padded off the way he had come. Delinda and Azric both knew he had allowed her to hear his instructions to Azric as a warning not to distract him. Do you know what he meant by that? Delinda asked after the vile lord glided away. I think so, in a vague sort of way. I'll find out more the next time I study. Azric's greatest fear was that the Siling would discover the flaw in his control and close it. The sorcerer did not know if he could do anything to prevent its discovery, if the creature purposefully searched his mind. But he would do his best to avoid any errant thoughts of it to surface, and pray it was sufficient. The couple resumed their walk, before Azric decided he needed to return to his room and sleep. Whatever limbo he had been in had not afforded much, if any, real rest. He awoke early enough the next morning to break his fast with Delinda before going to the library to study. He sat in the center of the room, relaxed, and slipped into a meditative trance. Normally he would connect with the source while in this condition, but this time he decided to see if he could delve deeper into his mind, into the same void Lord Zornin's mental assault had sent him. He was able to reach a state of extreme relaxation and introspection, but it was nowhere near the level he needed to achieve total sensory deprivation. Azric did discover something odd, however. He searched his mind and found several partial patterns as well as casting techniques that had not existed before. He studied the sigils intently and recognized them as weavings for new spells, but they were incomplete. Even in their incomplete form, he was able to deduce their meaning and effect through detailed study. They were potent spells indeed, Two were earth-related and were based on similar properties to the spell he had created himself, which he had used to defeat Rangor in his last battle. Lord Zornin must have examined his mind for what he already knew and used that information, along with his own understanding of magic, to forge the basis of the spell within his mind. The other spell was a more powerful version of the spell that helped shield him from magical attacks. If he should ever fight another spellcaster, it would prove to be invaluable. The other bits of knowledge the Siling literally rammed into his brain involved two separate casting techniques. One allowed him to cast spells without verbal commands, the other without the need for somatic gestures. 
Both required a great deal more energy and focus to accomplish such a feat. Azric was ecstatic at his new discoveries, but he would still kill his master most painfully, the first chance he got. As Azric studied the new spell weavings, he also realized he needed to find a way to move about the arena more rapidly. Rangor's magically enhanced speed had taken him by surprise, and Azric could not disengage himself from melee combat to make effective use of his magical powers. He thought about the magical doorway Alistair had used the day the old mage had entered his former home. That would work. He just hoped he had the time to research it before his next battle. For now, he would focus his energy on the new weavings and casting techniques. That evening, he and Delinda sat in his room, and he told her about what he had learned. She was excited for him, but her anxiety over how he had attained the knowledge worried her. But what about being unconscious? What about that crack? Or whatever it was you saw. What if it's some kind of damage he did inside your brain? Azric shrugged, knowing there was little he could do about it if that were the case. I seem to be all right, all things considered. Just be careful, please. The gods only know what he did to you. I will, love. Don't worry about me. Impossible. I always worry about you. Thus far, Lord Zornan had left Azric to his studies without interference, nor had Azric been forced to fight in any more arena battles. Even with splitting his time between his studies and his cataloging duties, he managed to hone his new spells and abilities to an acceptable level of proficiency within a month. Such progression, to his knowledge, was unheard of. He was discovering that Zornin had done far more than simply carve knowledge into his brain. Azric's efficiency in gathering and shaping the source, and his understanding of sorcery in general, was noticeably greater. He had always been a good student, but his focus was sharper now. Lord Zornan occasionally checked on his progress to ensure his pet was advancing as he should. Satisfied that Azric was not neglecting his responsibilities, he left the sorcerer mostly to himself. It was toward the end of the month after he had recovered that the Siling appeared in the vault with a full score of Minotaur and human guards, all equipped for conflict and an extended expedition. I will be gone for a time. Continue to study and work with due diligence on your other duties. Expect your next tournament shortly after I return. The Siling paused and looked at the foul black staff, still resting untouched in the far corner of the chamber. After a few moments of contemplation, he crossed the room and took possession of the sinister artifact before opening the gate and stepping through with his entourage. The scene beyond the portal was a barren land of reddish stone and blowing dust. Lord Zornan and his soldiers stepped through the arch and into the wasteland beyond. Azric paid close attention to the operation of the portal as he always did, knowing that if he were ever able to free himself and Alinda, this was their best hope for their escape. With their master away, he and Alinda were able to spend more time together, particularly the knights. The time he spent with her was the greatest joy he had experienced for as long as he could remember. He prayed fervently to any god who would listen, that one day they would be able to be together, without the dark cloud of fear always hanging over them as slaves to an evil and capricious master. A second week passed before Lord Zornan unexpectedly returned late one night. Delinda awoke and jumped from the bed she shared with Azric, her husband in her mind. She and Azric had pledged their vows to one another and considered themselves a married couple, even if there were no priests or governing lords to officiate their union. What is it? Azric asked, fully alert at the moment he felt Delinda spring from the bed. The master has returned. He summons me. I have to go tend to him. She told him hurriedly as she threw a long shift over herself and pulled on her slippers. Azric threw on a robe, donned his own slippers, and followed her out of the room with a sigh. He had to run to keep up with her as she bolted up the stairs, not wanting to keep the master waiting. They met Lord Zorn in partway up the stairs with its guards in tow. He had managed to return with a higher percentage of his guards this time, though still fewer than when he had left. The siding's robes were scorched and tattered, and all of his guards showed signs of combat as well. Delinda, attend to my guards and me downstairs. Pet, you know what to do with this, he said as he shoved a thick leather and wood-bound tome into Azric's hands. Be very careful with it. It is by far the most valuable object I have ever collected. Delinda followed the group downstairs, while Azra continued the ascent to the vault chamber 
with his master's newest acquisition. He was going to just stuff the book on a shelf and deal with it in the morning, but he was awake now, and his curiosity won out over his desire to return to his bed. The book was written in a familiar language, but with a very old-style grammar and syntax, as if written in centuries past. As he delved deeper into the pages, he began to find historical references to people and events that occurred in his own kingdom's past. He soon realized this book must have come from his own world. He tried to recall the exact sequence Lord Zornan had used to open the gate. When he was certain he remembered everything correctly, he wrote it down in the ledger of his catalog book so he could duplicate the process if he ever got the chance. Not only did the book come from his world, there was a fantastic amount of information regarding ancient forms of magic. Azric had only been able to study at the academy a couple of years, but he was certain much of what he read had been lost over the centuries. There was a treatise written in great detail by a wizard of obviously extraordinary power. It detailed magical concepts and spell mastery unheard of today by any wizard or in any writings he knew of. Much of this writing was far beyond Azric's understanding, but years or even decades of study would change that. Azric was so absorbed in his readings, he lost track of time. His stomach told him it was probably past time to break his fast with Delinda, but he walked briskly down the stairs in hopes of catching her still in the kitchen. He felt a bit of disappointment when he strode through the kitchen door to be greeted only by Cook and the smell of fried ham, eggs, and oatmeal. Morning, Cook. Have you seen Delinda yet? Azrug asked as he resigned himself to the small empty table against the kitchen wall. Aye, lad. She's been shuttling plates of food to Lord Zornan's men and tending their hurts all morning. Ah, oh, I think I hear her coming now. He replied just before the door swung open. Azrug looked into Delinda's tired eyes, which brightened when she saw him sitting in the kitchen waiting for her. Oh, I'm glad you made it. Did you stay up also, or did you go back to bed? I stayed up. The book he brought me back was too fascinating for me to go back to bed. At least alone. Good. I was getting peevish with jealousy thinking of you sleeping away the morning while I was up working. I am glad to know you appreciate my suffering. Delinda was forced to eat a hurried breakfast before returning to her duties. Azur took the time to drink a second cup of tea before bidding Cook farewell and resuming his own studies and tasks. As much as he wanted to delve back into the new tome, he needed to continue his proper studying. He had not yet mastered the portal spell, and he wanted to have it ready before his next battle. As luck would have it, Azric managed to squeeze in another week of study before Lord Zornan found him in the library to inform him that his next bout would be in two weeks. Good fortune and hard work paid off for him once again as he completed the gate spell the very next week. He spent the remainder of the week honing it and the other spells he had learned to battlefield effectiveness. It took endless long nights and early mornings to accomplish, but by the time the day of his battle arrived, he had perfected his spells to the highest degree of proficiency he could expect, given the time he had available. A couple of the gladiators looked at him with increased hostility, but the vast amount of fighters showed him increased respect and acceptance as Bronlin got him prepared. Azric was now in a higher fighting bracket, so he was able to retain the magical items he used in the last fight and would do so until a loss moved him back down, assuming he survived a loss, which few did. The only thing he knew about this fight was that his opponent was a creature and not a fighter. Gladiators were pitted against powerful and dangerous animals nearly as often as they were against more intelligent humanoid opponents. In fact, as a fighter gained in popularity, they increasingly fought against creatures to improve the likelihood of their continued survival while still providing a good show for the crowd. The spectators cheered when Azric entered the arena, chanting his name and stomping their feet. Despite his disgust at being forced to fight and kill for someone else's pleasure, his pride, and perhaps even a small part of his ego, could not help but find a little bit of satisfaction in the recognition he received. The adulations went on for several long minutes before subsiding. The clinking and rattling of chains drew his and the audience's attention to the other gate as it slowly opened. One of the strangest creatures Azric had ever seen cautiously emerged from the dark portal. It was a huge beast nearly twice the length and height of a bull. It sported six squat but powerfully thick legs. Its hide was the color of stone and covered with large fish-like scales the size of serving trays. It had a long, flat face, ending in a short bony muzzle. Its wide head sported horns, each as long as Azric's arm, 
sticking straight out above its small, beady eyes. It snuffled loudly as it swung its armor-plated head back and forth. Azur cast his duplicate spell, and his illusory clone sprang out around him, shifting positions every few seconds to help confuse his enemy. Given the way the creature was casting its head about, Azur could assume the creature probably had rather poor eyesight, but it tensed up when it apparently picked up his scent. The creature seemed to stare straight at the sorcerer as its small round ears twitched toward him and it took another deep breath through its nostrils. It sounded a long, loud trumpeting challenge and charged directly at him, not falling for his magical trick. Despite the creature's great mass, those thick legs propelled it across the arena at a fantastic speed. It would not likely win any endurance runs, but its sprinting ability was incredible. Azurg released a lightning bolt straight at its broad head. Twin bright white bolts limbed in crackling blue energy forked out at the rushing monster and scored black burns across its thick scaly plates. The creature let out a bugle of either pain or anger, but it did not slow or deviate from its course in the least. Azurg threw himself aside to avoid being trampled under several tons of charging flesh and bone. He evaded the pounding flat feet, but two of his images were less fortunate. The great ivory horns and the creature's own girth tore through them, rending them to miss. He rolled to his feet and launched a stream of magical bolts into the armored gray side as it wheeled about for another charge. Despite the enormous size and inertia of the creature, it managed to twist around and reverse its charge with startling rapidity. Azurk tried to dodge again, but the little space it had was still sufficient for the animal to get a full head of steam. It clipped his hip and spun him painfully to the ground. It whirled around for a third pass as Azric picked himself up, trying to ignore his throbbing bruised thigh. He barely had enough time to cast his dimensional gate and jump through before the beast trampled the ground where he had just been standing a second before. His magical gate deposited him close to the wall at the far side of the arena. The beast cast its head around and charged as soon as it picked up his scent once again. Azric launched a bright, fiery arrow and struck the creature directly in its broad chest, but its only reaction was a trumpet of rage and it lowered its horns in another attempt to skewer its antagonist. Azric opened up another gate and leapt through, once again just in time to avoid the lethal rush, and found himself near the distant end of the arena. He shook out the disorienting effects of traveling through the dimensional doorway as the massive beast charged across the arena after him. Azric raised his arms and uttered a string of arcane words. Stone spikes erupted from the ground, directly in the charging animal's path. The beast tore through the deadly obstacle without slowing and shattered the granite heart spears, with little more than some deep scoring on its armor-plated hide. Azric was forced to escape the beast's wrath once more by way of his gate spell. He was becoming truly alarmed at the ineffectiveness of his spells to cause any significant damage to the six-legged juggernaut. He racked his mind for a solution to his dilemma, as the monster bore down on him once more. An idea finally formulated in his mind. As the beast neared, intent on killing the small annoying creature in front of it, he cast his dimensional portal once again. However, instead of fleeing through it, he dove to the side at the last moment. The raging beast plowed straight through the magical doorway, where it emerged on the other side of the arena, a scant number of feet from the magically reinforced rock wall. Unable to arrest his charge, the creature slammed into the immobile barrier at a dead sprint. With all of its considerable mass behind it, the long ivory horns broke against the stone, and a sickening crack echoed above the sound of the bone-jarring impact. Several spectators jumped from their seats the instant they saw the beast heading straight at them, despite the protection of the wall before them. They sat back down with nervous laughs at their own reaction as the beast sank down to the ground. Azurg edged toward the doomed creature and saw blood streaming out of his nose and spattering the wall as it huffed in short, panting breaths. The victorious sorcerer looked sympathetically into the beast's small black eyes as they slowly glazed over and it breathed out its last, rattling breath. He felt disgusted at the senseless loss and his own feeling of pride for the cheers of the people around him, people he saw as more animal or monster than the unfortunate creature lying dead before him. He walked slowly back toward the gate that allowed him to leave the arena and the cheers of the audience behind him. He no longer cared for their adulations and remained silent all the way back to the tower. Even when his master commented on his performance and cleverness in defeating the creature in such an unorthodox manner, 
he merely grunted and shrugged in reply. Lord Zornan did not let on that he sensed his fighter's dismay, but Azric was certain the Silent knew exactly how he felt and why, just as he knew his evil master took pleasure in his consternation. Delinda met him in the courtyard as she always did, and blissfully threw herself into his arms when she saw he had returned unharmed. Azric returned her embrace, but not her joy, and she clearly felt it in his touch. She did not say anything then, instead choosing to follow him as he plodded up the stairs and retreated to his room. You seem unhurt. What troubles you so much? She asked as soon as the door closed behind them. I fought a creature today. Not a man or anything close to the intelligence of a man. Why does that bother you so? I know you do not like fighting for their amusement, but never have I seen you this upset by doing what you must. Azric's face darkened with renewed anger. A man or anything close to such knows why he is in the arena and what he must do whether he is a willing participant or not. That beast knew no such thing. It was taken from its home and put into the arena to be slaughtered. It was not evil. It had no particular hate or desire to kill me personally. It saw me as a threat or perhaps an interloper into its territory and defended itself as its nature dictated. It may not even have had those primal instincts directing it. The gods know what these bug-faced monsters did to its mind to make it fight. It was an innocent. It was even more of a slave than I am. I swear, I will make these creatures pay for what they do to us. Delinda held him tightly and rocked him in her arms in an attempt to console him. I'm sorry, my love. I'm sorry you have to kill to survive. But I would be sorrier if you had not come back to me. His rage eventually turned into exhaustion, and he fell into a fitful slumber in her arms. He awoke sometime after the sun had set. Delinda was lying beside him, sleeping contentedly, so he simply wrapped her in an embrace and fell back to a more restful sleep. Azric returned to his regular duties of organizing and cataloging the assortment of items in his master's vault. He spent far more time reading than actually delving into the secrets of many of the artifacts, but he made certain to spend enough time each day doing the latter so as to not appear neglectful of his tasks. The peace he found by losing himself in the books around him was short-lived. You will fight in the arena in two weeks. This will likely be the most difficult battle you have faced thus far and the most important one to me. Azric looked up from the ancient book he was studying and saw the Silent standing in the now open doorway. Azric wondered how the creature could move so quietly. Maybe he used his abilities to block out his presence from Azric's mind. He discarded these ponderings as unimportant as his master continued to address him. One of my arch rivals has issued a personal challenge and the wagers are exceptionally high. As it is a private contest, this fighter has not advanced through the rankings. I do not know the strength or capabilities of this champion, but he must have gained possession of a gladiator of exceptional power to be so confident of his success. Need I remind you of the consequences of disappointing me? No, you don't. Do not fail me. He did not bother to reply. He was always ready, and whether or not he was had no bearing on what was going to happen anyway. His pathetic resistance seemed childish now, and needlessly exhausting. He would get his moment, or he wouldn't. There was no sense in wasting energy or even words until the time actually arrived. Azric found Delinda and told her of his upcoming battle. I have been distilling another healing potion since before your last battle in order to make it as potent as I could. I will start another one now. It will not be as strong as the first one, but it will help, she said, her trembling voice betraying her fear for Azric's safety. You do not seem to have much confidence in me if you think I will be injured so badly. I know of this other creature who has challenged Lord Zornan. They are bitter rivals, and he would not have made such a public challenge unless he was supremely confident of his chances to win. I am sure you will be victorious. My mind will not allow me to think otherwise but it is sure to be a most difficult battle. We both must face the fact that it is unlikely you will emerge unscathed, so it is best we be prepared for it. Azric hugged her closely, grateful for her support. I am lucky to have you by my side. Azric spent the time he had practicing his spells. He experimented with using different combinations and tried to imagine every possible scenario ahead of time 
so he could react quickly and properly. When the day of his fight came, Azric stepped out into the courtyard to accompany his master to the games. He was surprised to see Delinda standing next to Lord Zornan and the palanquin. She was standing resolutely, with a canvas satchel hung over one shoulder, prepared for an argument. Delinda, what are you doing here? Azric asked. Lord Zornan has agreed to allow me to go with you to the arena. I brought the potions with me. The sooner they are administered, the more effective they will be. Azric was going to argue, but the determined look in her eyes showed that he could not dissuade her. Will you be watching the battle? No. I will stay with Bronlin in the trainer's room. Good. This is not something I wish you to see. Nor would I. The two humans and the Siling loaded themselves into the palanquin and were borne on the wide shoulders of the minotaurs to the arena. Delinda squeezed Azric's hand the entire way and did not let go until they were in Bronlin's training room. I think you got a hard fight on your hands this time, lad. Can you tell me anything about him? It's a she, and an abyssal elf. Rumor has it, she's a wizard too. I have to fight a woman? Delinda's face darkened. You're damn right you have to fight a woman, and you will hit her with everything you have. You had better not take it easy on her just because she's a girl. You can be sure she won't do the same for you. She's right, kid. Don't go soft just because she's a she. She's an abyssal elf to boot. Abyssal elves are a mean bunch, and masters of magic. They look down on surface races as being inferior in every way. They are fast and smart, so you better be on your toes. All right, I'll do my best. Azric prepared himself as he entered the arena by casting a ward to protect him from magical attacks. Azric was a crowd favorite by now, and they cheered loudly for him when he entered the fighting pit. The crowd fell silent as the abyssal elf entered through the other gate. She was shorter than he was, but not by much. She strode with the grace and surety of a queen. Her skin was stark white, like freshly fallen snow, and it contrasted eerily with her large black eyes. Her silver hair hung in a tight braid down her back, reaching past her waist. She wore a pair of tight-fitting black breeches and a tunic. A short black cape or cloak trailed down her back, split down the center by her braided hair. She would have been startlingly beautiful were it not for the aura of menace radiating from her. The official dropped the kerchief, and both casters broke into the chanting and hand-waving of spell casting. Azric's spell was a minor one and quick to cast. His illusory duplicate sprung out around him to confuse his enemy as to his true location. The elf formed a familiar weave. Azric deduced the intent of the spell and bolted quickly to the left as the wizard flung her hand forward. A massive ball of fire erupted a scant second later, where he had just been standing. He felt the searing heat wash over his back, but his quick thinking and spell shield saved him from serious burns. He retaliated with a lightning bolt the instant he leapt to his feet. He saw the telltale flicker of it meeting the spell shield of the abyssal elf. What little energy got through seemed to inflict little, if any, harm on the alabaster-skinned wizard. Frustrated, he began another incantation, as the Abyssal Elf completed her follow-up spell. Azur did not notice any immediate effects, nor did he recognize the spell she cast. He threw his hand forward and launched a heavy arrow of fire straight at his opponent. He stared in shock when the wizard suddenly disappeared. He spun around and found her several yards off to his right. Bolts of arcane power slammed into him before he could ready himself. His shield absorbed most of them, but two managed to penetrate and sting him smartly. Azur was holding his spell at the ready when the Abyssal Elf blinked away once more. He turned in a circle, casting his eyes all around the arena as he waited for her to reappear. Azur launched another lightning bolt at her as soon as she popped into existence. The electrical charge caught her squarely and sent her staggering several steps backward. She cursed something in a language resembling Elven, but it sounded darker and more sinister in tone. Azur made out the words man, human, and what he assumed was a powerful expletive before she blinked away again. Azric tried to spot her before she could retaliate, but he was too slow in discovering her new location. She appeared only a score of yards away and brought her palms together in front of her, with her fingers blade outward at an angle, forming a V lying on its side. A swirling vortex of skin-numbing frost erupted from her delicate white hands. The icy blast caught Azric full on, despite his best attempt to dodge the attack. He felt his clothes stiffen and his skin burn from the Sub-Zero assault. He forced his frozen fingers to obey and hastily cast his portal spell to get away from the current kill zone. 
he escaped just in time, as another fireball burst directly over the area he had just vacated. It was the Abyssal Elf's turn to scan the arena for him, before he got the jump on her. Her own dislocation spell now worked against her as she tried to search the grounds, while her position changed every few seconds. Azurg released his spell the moment his opponent blinked back into view. Stone spikes erupted from the earth and covered a large patch of ground with their deadly sharp tips. The elf amazingly spun away, somehow avoiding the stabbing stone spears enough to keep from being impaled. One of the tips did manage to tear a deep gouge in her left hip and thigh. Instead of cursing him in anger or outrage, she actually smiled and nodded in appreciation at the human's clever spell. The abyssal elf mage rapidly waved her slender hands in a complex pattern. Azard sent a barrage of magic darts streaming at her in hopes of interrupting her spell, but her shield negated all but one missile, which did not appear to phase her. She shouted her spell's execution command, and Azard felt the earth rumble beneath his feet. He dove to the side as a column of stone erupted beneath him and shot 40 feet in the air, taking barely a second to reach its apex. He tried to regain his feet, but another colossal stone pillar burst directly under him. He splayed himself across his five-foot-wide surface as it launched him above the arena floor. The column reached its apex in the blink of an eye, and the sheer velocity of it catapulted him another 30 feet into the air. Azric forced himself to remain calm despite the terrifying situation in which he found himself. He controlled his falling flight and carefully but rapidly drew the magical weaving he hoped would save his life. The portal flared open directly below him a fraction of a second before the hard, unyielding ground abruptly and lethally arrested his fall. Azric's body flew out of the gateway's exit point in a low arc before hitting the sandy floor and rolling to a stop in a cloud of dust. Azric's quick thinking and clever spell use had saved his life for the moment, but his uncontrolled slide and tumble across the arena floor introduced his body to a world of pain. He was certain one arm was broken as he opened his dirt-encrusted eyes and saw it bent at an unnatural angle. The sharp pain accompanying every shallow breath attested to several broken ribs. As he struggled to his feet, another sharp pain lanced up his right leg, which refused to support him. He managed to stand, bearing most of his weight on his left leg, as the abyssal elf seductively sashayed toward him. She came to a stop, and seemed to study him for a moment, before speaking. You are clever for a human, and you fought well, she said in a surprisingly deep, but soft and melodious voice. It is a shame one with your talents at such a young age must meet his end in this place. But... Look on the bright side. At least you will no longer be a prisoner of these vile creatures. She looked forlorn for a moment. I look forward to the day I can say the same. I just pray I can take some of them with me when I go. She began chanting the words to another spell, and Azurg knew there was nothing he could do to prevent her from destroying him now. His body was too battered to attempt to dodge, flee, or cast a counterspell. All he could do was brace himself as an invisible force slammed into him with the weight of a runaway carriage. His already broken body was blasted backward, and he landed in a heap several yards away. The abyssal elf stalked forward when the human sorcerer refused to submit to death. She stared down at his battered and broken form, summoning the energy for a simple spell to extinguish what little spark of life still flickered inside him. She had never known the emotion called remorse, but the feeling she had at being forced to kill such a rare spellcaster for no reason except for a master's entertainment came as close as she likely ever would. She would have been delighted to be able to dissect the young human's mind and abilities at her leisure. Ah, <sighs> what a waste, the elf said as she prepared to unleash her spell.